little adjustment here. Hopefully that's not too loud. We should be live right now. Hi everyone. Welcome to my channel and welcome to another live stream. Today we're talking about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, our open discussion. And this is part 10. We've done a few of these over the last uh, couple of years, two, three years, and we've created some additional content uh, regarding Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So we're continuing uh, this discussion to see where it leads us. And this is day two of two. Um, and what we did yesterday was uh, basically we read a couple of articles and uh, we watched, uh, I believe, a couple of videos, uh, interviews and discussions regarding uh, Julian Assange's case. And uh, today we're going to do the same thing. We're going to read an article. There's a couple of three videos that got lined up, actually. So I have more videos lined up than articles. Well, I do have articles lined up, but I like to go through one article short article and then there's like three videos uh that we can watch i'm gonna ask chat which one they prefer to um watch or if all of them and then there's a couple of very long articles i've got queued up to read i'm not sure if we're gonna get to those but we'll talk about it once people start rolling in once uh, notifications go out and yesterday i know the twitch notifications didn't go out um right away the the discord notifications went out but the twitch notifications didn't go out so until notifications go out uh, i'm just going to give you guys a little intro as to what this is about i am on patreon patreon.com forward slash chicho chycho if you want to support this work patreon is a fantastic way to do so if you want to follow this work patreon is a fantastic way to do so you can follow the work i don't put anything beyond paywalls everything is creative commons share and share a like and if you like what you see after a while and if you think this work deserves support um your support through funds then patreon is a fantastic way uh to do that we are live streaming on twitch twitch.tv forward slash chicho live c-h-y-c-h-o-l-i-v-e okay if you want to participate in the chat that's happening down there and you're going to see it here cheryl good morning how are you doing Twitch is where you want to be at. Uh, for the malls that have been taking care of business here for a number of years, for at least three years now, thank you very much for the support. For those of you who've been coming onto the live streams to participate in these discussions, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the subs. Thank you for the follows. Thank you for the cheers. Okay. Lonely Piggy, how are you doing? Chicho and Chad, hope all is well. Another important stream today. Another important stream today, Lonely Piggy. And today, by the way, is November. I think I mentioned that. I might not have. November 3rd, 2020, right? It's U.S. Election Day. So there's a reason why I scheduled two Julian Assange streams for November 2nd and November 3rd, because in my opinion, what happens to Julian Assange is a lot more important than what happens in the U.S. elections right now. Julian Assange's fate, our fate, is tied to Julian Assange. What happens to Julian Assange will decide how Western civilization will function for a number of decades to come. What happens in the United States is a hiccup. Okay. Uh, and we've talked about this. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Wingnut, how are you doing? 1010, 10. hello, Chicho, hello, hello. Tyson Terror 7, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Ch yeah, Twitching Jason, good morning, all. F fun day ahead here in the US. Hope everyone as well. Hope everyone as well, gang. Fun indeed. And it's not going to, anything's, nothing's going to be decided today. Uh, we'll see where everything goes, right? Uh, Plus. Pladen, Pladen's rule. How are you doing? Good day to you from Finland. Good day, Finland. How are you doing? Salutations from the west coast of Canada. Hope you're doing well. Thorn. Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, from Waterloo. Waterloo. I've been to Waterloo. I lived in Waterloo for five plus years. What a fantastic, fantastic Waterloo, Ontario. Anyway, Canada. I know there's a Waterloo in uh, UK as well, um, but uh, enjoyed Waterloo very much. The facet evening all finally caught one facet welcome welcome lonely piggy got our first snow in montreal overnight 
uh, any over in the west coast no nothing here right now we've been getting a lot of rain which is vancouver or west coast of uh, canada pacific northwest temperate rainforest that's our winter for the most part lots of rain overcast and it is beautiful it is beautiful it gets to some for me i love it i do love it i love the sun but i love it uh, manchester uk good morning and good evening manchester uk cheryl jealous oh cheryl you want the snow to come in gina how are you doing hi you teach on chat welcome welcome everyone twitching man i miss montreal probably one of the first places i'll visit once it's safe yeah montreal is beautiful i agree montreal is a fantastic city fantastic city amazing food amazing people amazing culture uh super fun amazing nightlife amazing nightlife i do announce these live streams 30 minutes before we go live on lo mys vk part of gap and twitter you can follow the work there carlos how are you doing good morning chicho glad to be here happy to be here woke up with a more positive mindset than i usually do it's election day in the u.s i'm in california everyone's losing it <laughs> i bet <laughs> it's the it's the final episode right until the next season kicks in so the production value of this charade is incredible incredible gina soft rain always helps me reach that wonderful uh, liminar state yeah it's beautiful it's beautiful i don't it was raining harder this morning i was hoping the hard rain would maintain that way you could hear it but uh it calmed down a little bit paladin's rule we had our first snow a week ago and now it's been just raining non-stop paladin you're in finland you said where are you from finland yeah you guys have very much the same uh, climate as uh, we do in canada uh, on the west coast anyway i believe only 100 1455 days until the next one <laughs> sure not really because you have the senate and stuff in two years right so you have this and then two years you got that stuff and then you got another one and then you got another one so every two year cycle and the election cycle is never over so they start pumping money into it a year before any election at least so it's a constant election cycle gotta keep the people entertained gotta gotta keep the people entertained carlos haha the final episode exactly chicho i call it a novella which is just spanish for soap opera <laughs> it is health and health and wealth to everyone health and wealth to everyone the end is nigh tyson not even it's just beginning it's just beginning this is kicking into the next phase of what is coming for live streams when we don't have any visuals when we do open discussion we do upload the audios to soundcloud.com forward slash chicho chycho as podcast and for these two live streams that we have uh, right now i will try to upload the streams to uh, the audio to soundcloud i'll have to extract it out of the video because we will be watching video and uh, the mic won't pick it up so it has to be extracted from the live stream so i'll try my best uh, to do that okay and these podcasts should be available on your favorite podcasting platform including spotify on itunes and we will be uploading this video to both this live stream to both bitshoot and youtube okay julian assange streams are one of the topics that i've chosen to discuss in the content that i'm creating along with mathematics comic books food politics economics entheogens and whatnot julian assange streams is one that i will not censor off youtube personal censor so we will continue to share that information on youtube and um, if we will be hurt by it uh, there's no doubt since we started covering julian assange and the trial and uh, started doing readings of wikileaks files um, to a certain degree well in large part we've been uh, demoted on youtube so we don't get recommended as often and there's certain shenanigans taking place so be it okay if the censors seriously kick in and uh, they decide to censor any 
channels that have shared information from WikiLeaks because we've done the Wall 7 readings, we've done the Guantanamo Bay files, and we've done the OPCW leaks, right? If they decide at some point, which that's the direction they're going, that anyone that has shared any type of information like that, those channels will be videos will be deleted or channels will be deleted or whatever it is. If we get the platform off YouTube, remember, gang, we are on BitChute and you can find us there. Okay. VC, how are you doing? Hey, Chicho, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Kebabs, greetings, greetings. Hope you guys are doing well. Gang, let's start talking about Julian Assange. Now, here's the, here's the thing, right? Let me show you what I got lined up for us to cover. And you guys tell me how you guys want to approach this. Okay. Now, I'm going to read... Uh, article on consortium news by Pepe Escobar. It's a short article. It's called Juni Assange, Prometheus Bound. Okay, it's just a sort of a poetic little piece that Pepe Escobar uh, wrote comparing uh, Julian Assange to Prometheus and uh, sort of Greek mythology and stuff like this. I'm going to brutalize the Greek names, but it is what it is. Um, so, or the names, period. Uh, so I do want to read this article and then I have two videos that we can look at. One of them is the first John Pilger interview with Julian Assange. Okay. First John Pilger interview with Julian Assange and it's an hour and eight minutes long. Okay. So, and it's an important interview. It's, it occurred in 2010, 10 years ago. I believe this occurred right after the Iraq war logs, which is the reason that the US government is trying to extradite Julian Assange to the United States. Contrary to what people believe, it's not because of the Clinton email leaks from 2016 that got all the, I can't say the word, really pissed off at WikiLeaks and Julian Assange because they believed, they blamed WikiLeaks and Julian Assange for getting Trump into power, which was the most ridiculous thing that just children really uh, throwing a tamper tantrum, right? So all those liberal channels, people started throwing a lot of hate in Julian Assange's way. Okay, so they began the cascade of uh, this central power to a certain degree uh, in the eyes of the populace being justified to go after Julian Assange. But it is because of the Iraq war logs that the U.S. government is trying to extradite them out in the United States. So this occurred, I believe, right after Iraq war logs. Okay. And as you can tell, this is a younger Julian Assange. And this is hour and eight minutes. So let me know if you guys want to watch this. It's very chill, very chill. It's very ASMR if you want to nice, have a nice low uh, key calm morning okay or evening and then there's a 2016 interview of john pilger with julian assange and you can tell in six years julian assange has aged a lot right so we can watch this and this one's only 24 minutes or we can watch this right after the next one okay uh null uh, ron ron all scott it's election day. I'm a little worried about how the U.S. is going to be after today. That is the key. Uh, riots may be, may be crazy. It most likely, possibly, and from certain reports coming in, there's a lot of bricks being laid. Uh, or let me rephrase: there's a lot of bricks being dropped off in certain key locations around the United States without any construction in sight. Emily, hello. Uh, Envious, how are you doing? Good evening from Germany, everyone. Good evening, Envious. Hope you're doing well. So we can watch this one as well. And I've watched, I've read and watched all of these except one of the articles that I want to show you. So we can watch this as well. And this is important as well. Then there's a very long article by Patrick Lawrence. Okay, the revelations of WikiLeaks number nine, opening CIA's vault. And this uh, Patrick Lawrence has written a tremendous amount of articles on Julian Assange, on politics, on economic, on everything. And if you haven't read any of his work, I highly recommend reading his work. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to link up these articles. So those of you in articles and videos, those of you in chat that 
want to sort of bookmark these please let me know big work bricks equals pallets that sounds scary must be the leftover brick from the wall that blew over <laughs> uh, gina whoa bricks i'm interested in reading more about that it's just stuff that i've come across and there were in a weird way bricks being laid in a lot of other uh certain other times as well in the last uh, few months here's the other interview here's the patrick lawrence article well worth the read heavy read lots of info like really tremendous amount lots of names lots of connections thank you for sharing the links my pleasure envious here's another interview by um, kevin costala uh, costanza with uh, interview with major major mar marjorie cohen on the 10th anniversary of wikileaks publishing iraq war logs which is basically related to this interview so maybe we can flip into this interview okay because it goes into the 10th anniversary of what the iraq war logs revealed for us right so that might be a good combo so that'll be like an hour and a half of just watching interviews right which i'm okay with sorry i failed in my memory mission elder god no worries brother <laughs> oh, funny funny and here's an article of julian assange uh titled julian assange faces the trial of the century 10 reasons why it threatens freedom of speech from the gray zone by fidel uh narvez and ben norton and i've read halfway through this uh now i haven't gone through the whole thing it's well worth reading um at some point uh, you know i'm gonna read it uh but there's so much information to go through right and it's a great and here's another interview and here's an interview with john pilger regarding julian assange's trial and it's sort of the up-to-date information regarding what have what's going on with julian assange and we read an article by julian assange by john pilger regarding the trials right twitching jason if we're picking picking i'm up for most chill one up to you guys though okay yeah you guys you guys decide the most chill one is this one it's an hour and eight one hour and eight minutes of john pilger talking to julian assange and this is when wikileaks and julian assange really hit the international radar with the iraq war logs and the collateral murder video and all this right extremely important because and i my vote is on this as well tell you the truth because uh julian assange has been dehumanized right that's what the corporate propagandists and centralized power and the police forces and the mainstream news networks have been doing they've been dehumanizing julian assange and dishumanizes him very important right now just to give you a perspective on what this is about okay what's happening with julian assange is a show trial it is it is as far as i'm concerned the greatest show trial of the century that as pepe escobar or someone else has written it would make uh nazi germany stalin and uh, any dictatorial power envious of the way it's being conducted right they didn't even have the balls to conduct a show trial on this level okay and that's happening in the uk right and one of the authors as you know i i i i like and i read and i've read a lot of his articles and i've listened to a lot of his interviews and stuff like this is robert anton wilson and robert anton wilson wrote a punk metal cyberpunk metal play musical play regarding the trial of wilhelm reich and it's called wilhelm reich in hell it's this book here okay now you're not gonna see it uh well enough on this thing i'm just going to bring it closer make sure it's... so wilhelm reich and hell this is an important book as far as i'm concerned it's not bad i've taken some notes in this right let me read you the synopsis of this on amazon okay and this is and i don't recommend buying off amazon i'm just 
showing you this because it has a good synopsis and it's got a quote from Wilhelm Reich. Okay, so the description for this book, if you want to, you know, know what this book is about, Wilhelm Reich in Hell. Okay, quote, the great psychi uh, psychiatrist Wilhelm Reich once wrote, quote, no president, ac ac academy, court of law, Congress, or Senate on this earth has the knowledge or power to decide what will be knowledge, what will be the knowledge of tomorrow, end quote. In 1957, the government of the United States of America jailed Dr. Will, Dr. Reich and burnt all of his published works. Wilhelm Reich in Hell pro provides a remarkable new look at the vilification and destruction of a great man who refused to bow to Gestapo toxic tactics. And if you know the history of Wilhelm Reich and what this is all about, and he's the he's the Wilhelm Reich is the person that in our book club we've talked about and we've read certain parts of uh, uh, the mass psychology of fascism he wrote about fascism he lived through fascism okay and this is basically sort of a cyberpunk musical of a show trial that robert anton wilson wrote regarding wilhelm reich okay and believe it or not this wilhelm reich in hell already has a musical as well and i'm going to rate this as a 10 because i've seen this a couple of times okay and it's a musical that has been uh, has seen you know i don't know if it's been played on broadway but it has been it's a musical that has been uh performed live and there's a movie on this wilhelm reich and hell and i tried to find this and i couldn't find it online for some reason but i'll give you the description of this as well okay the summary of wilhelm reich in hell which is this book here turned into a musical movie right it is very much on the same level as the rocky horror picture show but not as famous unfortunately right and here's the description for this i'm just going to pop on the chat just so i'm not missing anything uh, quote law and order on acid and in hell only robert anton wilson could conjure courtroom punk rock drama blending marilyn monroe the marquis de said uh gorgiev the american medical association aka the world's greatest rock band and the horror of the condition of planet earth dr wilhelm reich infamous austrian american psych psychoanalyst and researcher whose books were burnt by Hitler, Stalin, and the US government, finds himself against accused finds himself again accused of thought crime, offered a final attempt to free mankind from his emotional plague. Reich leads his own defense amid a surreal and frightening spectacle of sex, violence, liberty, and fascism. Okay. Links on screen hide a bit of uh, content showing okay hold on let me do this Doop. let me give you guys the link to these things as well oh yeah here's uh john pilger's own page where he has wilhelm reich's oh not wilhelm Reich. his first interview on there love raw love raw me too okay here's the book uh on amazon if you want to know what it is again i recommend buying it locally instead of amazon and here's the you know i'll give you the imdb page for for wilhelm reich and hell okay that way you guys have all the links that you need so gang let's read this article first uh and uh what was the comment lonely piggy links on screen hide a bit of the content content shown Ch -ch 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 uh links on screen so we're we talking about the top i got black bars up top because it's uh black bars up top in the bottom because oh these guys oh my god i forgot to take these down thank you lonely piggy my bad that was ridiculous thanks i appreciate it and what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn off chat as well thanks lonely piggy i should have known that silly me i was a member evil eye indeed indeed the patreon twitch oh thanks cheryl i didn't i didn't have my obs on like what you're seeing on screen is me seeing this so i was seeing my whole thing with uh, crap uh your social media thank you gina and thank you lonely thanks guys i think he means the 
patreon twitch yeah yeah unfortunately i left that on i'm going to turn off chat so the chat doesn't pop off on the screen because we're going to have the chat running on the side and again my apologies for those links i gotta have a little notes with me remove links and whatnot so i'm going to take the chat off so it doesn't pop on the screen anymore and um what i'm going to do is let's read pepe escobar's uh no problem man but yeah well it, it bugs me i'm sort of a perfectionist perfectionist try to be anyway uh regarding certain things and by the way as far as my snacks go uh you might see me eating on uh on uh, once we start watching a video i got some walnuts here boop and over here we got sunflower uh butter sunflower seed butter and honey mixed together so it's sort of sweet uh, fall is uh, for me is power food season okay so gang let's read pepe escobar's article little piece and then if there's anyone that wants to talk about something we'll pause a little bit and then we're going to watch the hour plus interview of john pilger and julian assange okay and i'm going to keep the chat up on the side here so uh Oh, I made it. Chicho inspired your yogurt bowl this morning. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Hope you had a great breakfast, uh, Twitching Jason. Chicho, you need a uh, B5 list protocol. I do indeed, Elder God. I do indeed. And Elder God, just so you know, I had a list when I first started to, uh, streaming on Twitch. I had a list of things I had to do before a live stream. <laughs> And I kept some of those things, and I was at some point I was going to do a do a live stream video on how to do a live stream video or how I went about it. Uh, oh yeah, you remember? That's right. That's right. I did share it. Gang, let's read this article. Pepe Escobar, Julian Assange, Prometheus Bound. I looked down. I looked down a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so let's read this quick article. Uh, Pepe Escobar, Julian Assange, Prometheus Bound. He's being punished not for stealing fire, but for exposing power under the light of truth and provoking the god of excep exceptionalism. And uh, just so you guys know, before we get into this, it's short, but it references a lot of Greek mythology. And when I was reading this article, I had to look up who all these people were, right? And Prometheus is... Um, deity god greek mythology where he brought fire to human beings and provided knowledge and stuff and the gods uh persecuted him right and then he references other people and had to or other gods and deities so i had to look up uh who some of those people were and it, it's pretty nice information if you want to learn about some of the references being made he is being punished not for not for stealing fire but for exposing power under the light of truth and provoking the god of exceptionalism and this picture is uh, police ejecting julian assange from ecuadorian embassy in london april 11 2019 by pepe escobar special to consortium news this is a tale of an ancient greek tragedy reenacted in anglo-america amid thundering silence and nearly universal indifference chained immobile invisible a squalid prometheus was transferred from the gallows for a show trial in a fox gothic court built on the site of a medieval prison kratos impersonating strength and by impersonating violence had duly chained Prometheus not to a mountain in the Cauc Caucasus, but to solitary confinement in a high security prison subject to relentless psychological torture. All along the Western watchtowers, no Hephaestus Hefet volunteered to forge in his smithy a degree of uh, reluctance or even a sliver of pity. Prometheus is being punished not for stealing fire but for exposing power under the light of truth thus provoking the unbound ire of zeus the exceptionalist who is only able to stage his crimes under multiple veils of secrecy prometheus 
pierce the myth of secrecy, which envelops Zeus's ability to control the human spectrum, and that is an anathema. Prometheus being chained by Vulc Vulcan, 1623 oil painting by Dirk von uh, Bab Babron. Okay. We continue. For years, debased, hacked stereographers, hack stereographers worked relentless, relentlessly to depict Prometheus as a lowly trickster an inconsequential forger abandoned smeared demonized prometheus was uh, comforted by only a small chorus of ocean Oshi Oshiad, craig murray john pilger daniel esberg wikileak warriors consortium writers prometheus was denied even the basic tools to organize a defense that might at least rattle zeus's cognitive dissident narrative Oceanus, the titan father of the Oceans, could not possibly urge Prometheus to appease Zeus. Fleetingly, Prometheus might have revealed to the chorus that exposing secrecy was not what best suited his heart's content. His plight might, might also, in the long run, revive popular attachment to the civil, civilizing arts. One day, Prometheus was visited by Io, a human maiden. He may have forecasted she would engage in no future travels and she would bear him two offsprings. And he may have foreseen that one of their de descendants, an unnamed ep epigen of Hercules, may many generations hence would release him figuratively from his torment. Zeus and his prosecutorial minions don't have much of a case against Prometheus, apart from possession and dissemination of classified exceptional information. Still, it was eventually up to Hermes, the messenger of gods, and significant, significantly the conduit of news to be sent down by Zeus in uncontrollable anger to demand that Prometheus admits he was guilty of trying to overthrow the rulers by rulers based order established by the supreme exceptional this is what's being ritualized at the current show trial which was never about justice prometheus won't be tamed in his mind he will be re 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 Rel reliving uh, Tennyson's Ulysses to retrieve, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So Zeus may finally strike him with the thunderbolt of exceptionalism, and Prometheus will be hurled into the abyss. Prometheus's th theft of the secrecy of power, though, is irreversible. His fate will will certainly prompt the late entrance of pandora and her jar of evils complete with unforeseen consequences whatever the verdict reached in that 17th century court it's far from certain that prometheus will enter history just as a mere object of blame for human folly because now the heart of the matter is that the mask of zeus has fallen Really, I think this is an exceptionally powerful uh, piece. And most people who don't understand what is happening to Julian Assange and what WikiLeaks is about and what centralized power is doing, this will go over their heads as if, like, whatever analogy you want to use, right? Most people will read this and go, what is Pepe Escobar talking about? And if you followed the Julian Assange case, you know what WikiLeaks was about. You know what this trial means to humanity, really. Okay. This piece is extremely powerful.
extremely powerful. Hello God, I love the story, but not the real remake. Hello Chicho, morning even though morning even though I'm having lunch right now. Good morning, Lark Bark, and good afternoon to you. Uh Shite Hawk. Any mention of the bit where Prometheus hit from a sexual assault and rape trial? Uh there was no rape trial. There were no sexual assault charges. They were talking to him about it. Those also good evening everyone good evening yeah there isn't and all of those those stuff coming from sweden it was just concocted it was it was it was lies right on behalf of the u.s government and sweden it, as far as i'm concerned the swedish government is on the same level as the uk government just puppets of the united states in large part lark park yeah sure why not it's never too early for lunch i'm not uh so much of the breakfast guy oh i love breakfast i understand every word of that message elder god i had to look up by the way gang i you know i i've read greek mythology before but me and names don't get along so i've you know i even had to look up prometheus uh, and read his write-up on prometheus to get an appreciation of what this article is and kudos to pepe escobar for writing such a powerful piece such a powerful piece gang and let me give you the link again for those that might have popped in here uh, later boing boing and this is the piece that we read okay i provided all these and i'll have the links to everything in the description of the video once uh, we upload this video to both bitshoot and youtube and here's the link to this video I had a classic education i was very lucky oh elder god you were seriously lucky zane how are you doing you were seriously lucky like for me um, all the stuff i i can't retain that information with the names and mythology because uh, i never got into them extremely deep right you're good doing good gang should we watch this video unless there's anything anyone wants to talk about mick uh hey chicho it's been a while off topic but just want to thank you for the talk we had about cancer back in may along with the video you posted on youtube afterwards too my dad oh i'm sorry to hear that man my dad passed away peacefully four days ago oh, peacefully is a good thing four days ago and truly your words helped a lot throughout that time bless gang let's watch the video elder god this one uh, this video um i don't have the timestamps. i've watched this video a couple of times i re-watched it again yesterday but i don't have the timestamps as to which parts to cut up uh we could yeah 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 we could pause it for sure elder god yeah you too mick be well uh what we can do chat uh i'll play the video and if anybody wants to talk about a specific segment just post a comment uh in our chat and i'll pause the video and we'll talk about it great idea elder god lark bark i'm terribly sorry for your loss mick uh lost my mother and uh, grandmother three years ago we're here for you indeed so gang we're gonna watch the video and anybody if you want pause just say chicho and for sure just put chicho pause and we could talk about it okay and and if it's right in the middle of the sentence i'll wait until either julian assange or uh, john pilger has finished their sentence and then we can talk about things great idea elder god and if we're going to do this the odds are um we're going to spend the rest of the stream talking about this okay gang here comes the video and let me know if the sound you want the sound to be higher i got it maxed out there and i haven't maxed out i don't have a maxed out here um i'm putting it on 50 but let me know if uh, the audio needs to be kicked up okay or kicked down okay gang
You've described WikiLeaks as untraceable and uncensorable. What do you mean by that? Well, nothing in this world is guaranteed for sure. But within that, um, we have put together an infrastructure using technical and legal techniques um, to really make it hard to trace people and mm -hmm. make it hard to take down our material once it's published. Mm -hmm. And to date, uh, we've had a 100% uh, success rate. Mm -hmm. So that basic idea and intention uh, is comprised of a number of specific ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So for untraceability, this means people send us material in the post in a particular way, mm -hmm. engaging in particular procedures which makes it effectively impossible to trace. Or it means they submit material to us online and bounce the information mm -hmm. uh, through dozens of computers around the world, each computer encrypting its transmissions before it connects to another computer. So in this way, discarding um, mm -hmm. identities as the information flows around the world. As it flows through different countries, we make sure it flows through Sweden and Belgium. And these two countries have specific source protection laws. In Sweden, as part of the Swedish constitution, the Press Freedom Act. Mm. And in Belgium, a specific law dealing with the communications protections uh, between a source and a journalist using any means whatsoever, including electronic transmissions. Mm. For publication, this means housing our servers um, in many different jurisdictions, such that uh, any sort of interim attack on us, interim injunction, is not going to take the information down entirely. It may knock it out here, it may knock it out there. Mm. Um, but we can put up servers and gain support and respond legally fast enough, such that the information is not going to be removed from the public. And that has been what has happened to date. We have never lost a court case in any jurisdiction. Mm. Um, important thing to remember. But there have been interim attempts to injunct us. And why those interim attempts have gone on, we have managed to keep publishing. Mm. How, many, how many documents of real value have you been able to accept and publish? Well, it's hard to know how many real value. I mean, this is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, to us, all information that is true has value, eventually. Mm. It may only be a, a very small value to someone somewhere. Mm. Um, but getting that information into the historical record, padding out the historical record, provides a sort of richness to every other bit of information in the historical record. So if you're talking about things which have clearly changed outcomes of elections or clearly introduced some law reform or clearly brought perpetrators to trial, mm. then this is in, in the hundreds, yeah. some, somewhere in the hundreds, um, for the clearly changing governments or elections or having ministers um, deposed, this is maybe half a dozen to ten, something like that. Mm. That's the power of information. It's an old truism, isn't it? And this is such a modern, ultra-modern form of getting it out. It must frighten um, a lot of establishments and authority, and especially governments. What governments have been successful in blocking it? In blocking yeah. WikiLeaks? The, the governments that have clearly uh, tried to interfere with readers' ability to look at what we publish mm. and um, leakers' ability to give us stuff. Uh, China is the worst offender. Mm. China has the most aggressive, sophisticated um, sort of interception technology that places itself in between every reader inside China and every information source outside mm. China. And so we've been fighting a, a running battle to uh, make sure our information can get through. So there's all sorts of ways that Chinese readers can read our site. But the, the first thing that they try doesn't work. The first thing you would imagine doing, just go to wikileaks.org, um, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But variations on that do work. Mm -hmm. um, Iran uh, has blocked us as well for a period. Uh, however, we are now unblocked um, in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, the Australian government 
uh, has added us to their list of secret internet sites that are to be blocked um, once a national sort of filtering system is put into place. That national mm -hmm. filtering system has not yet been put into place, um, but if it is, we'll be on the list. That's the only Western government, is it? There's also Germany. Mm. Uh, has done a similar thing to Australia. You know, in a similar position where they're trying to get up this national censorship system. It looks like it's not going to pass constitutional review. It looks like it won't get up. But mm. something important to understand is what happens in the West is privatised censorship. Mm. So, like it, most other institutions in the West, censorship has been privatised. And that means that big corporations go through the court system uh, to get injunctions and use the coercive power of the state, right, the ability to deploy armed police to force a court order. Um, mm. They use the court apparatus to do that. Mm. Um, there, I mean, there's other, other ways censorship occurs in the West, mm. through economic pushes and so on. But to give a specific example, a private bank it deals with wealthy private clients, minimum account balance of one million bucks, hides their assets around the world to make sure creditors, ex-wives, police, tax departments, and so on can't get them. Um, we revealed the trust structures in the Cayman Islands, the beneficiaries who set up the trust, how much money was in it, and so on. And they attacked us in the United States. So in the courts? A, in the courts. So it's a Swiss Cayman o operation using US federal law to try and attack us. Um, they attacked the main registration URL that people are familiar with, wikileaks.org, mm. because one of the companies involved in registering that was based in California. Right. And through that interim injunction, they did take that down for 10 days. Now, of course, we were still publishing on all our other mm. URLs, still publishing successfully out of Sweden, but the, the thing that people were most familiar with uh, was no longer available. Mm. Um, and we then responded uh, with a coalition of, of 20 lawyers and, and managed to turn that around. So quite an interesting result. Mm. It's not that the US justice system brings justice. It's not that the US justice system is always unjust but you have to bring justice to the US justice system. Mm. And if you have a big enough coalition with enough money, uh, you can force a good, a good verdict out of it. But mm. the initial verdict by the same judge was that we were to be shut down. Mm. It's interesting you mention justice there because I was going to ask you um, where the idea of WikiLeaks came from, but I mean, having a sense I get from you is that you've been using the technology technology to mine this information, uh, especially within authority, for, for, for quite a long time. But there's, there's really something, there's another element to it. There is an element of justice seeking about WikiLeaks, it seems to me, almost a moral element. That's I, won't, whole, I won't go as far as saying as a crusade, but there is there is a passion about it that's not just simply transparency. Um, there's something else. No, the goal is justice. The method is transparency. Okay. It's important not to confuse the goal and the method. Mm -hmm. um, so what I observed by looking at how the press worked and how successful activist campaigns work mm. is a very cheap and effective way of getting justice was finding information that people were spending effort on concealing and revealing it. Mm. Why do people spend effort on things? Well, because they believe it's going to benefit them. So when organizations spend effort to conceal something, they are making a statement. They're giving off an economic signal that if that information is revealed, it's going to have an effect. Mm. Well, otherwise, why would you spend the work? Mm. So in many of those cases, the effect that it will have uh, is a push to reform the organization mm. that is concealing some kind of abuse or some plan for some future abuse. Mm. Um, and so by selectively going after that information, as mm. opposed to all the other sorts of information out there, which there are a vast amount, we are able to selectively 
bring about just change. The arrival of WikiLeaks coincides with a whole, uh, um, almost a sense of permanent war. The term permanent war, perpetual war, is constantly used now in the United States, where we have two wars running together and others, and other secret wars. In the information that you have revealed on WikiLeaks about these so-called endless wars, what has been the real high-value material that has come out that has given people, ordinary people if you like, the kind of information upon which they can then act? Looking at the, the, the enormous quantity and diversity of these military or intelligence apparatus inside the documents. Um, what I see is a, a vast, sprawling um, estate, uh, the in, what we would traditionally call the military intelligence complex or military industrial complex. And that this sprawling um, industrial estate um, is growing, becoming more and more secretive, becoming more and more uncontrolled. This is not um, mm. a sophisticated conspiracy controlled at the top. This is a, a vast movement of self-interest mm. by thousands and thousands of players uh, all working together uh, and against each other mm. to produce a, an end result, which is Iraq and Afghanistan and you know, Colombia mm. and, and keeping that going. So what, what I see is... Um, we, you know, we often deal with tax havens and people hiding assets and transferring money uh, through mm. offshore tax havens. So I see some really quite remarkable similarities. Guantanamo is used for laundering people hmm. to an offshore haven, which doesn't follow the rule of law that we would normally expect. Tax haven is used for hiding people's assets, laundering people's assets through a jurisdiction which doesn't follow the rule of law that we would expect in our home countries. Similarly, Iraq and Afghanistan I, and Colombia are used to wash money out of the US, US tax base and back. Arms companies. Arms companies, yeah. Uh, and and the, the generals and so on, which uh, if you like, non-profit versions. Um, so that you can't just, or you mm. can't always, pull out two billion bucks uh, from the U.S. tax base and just say, "Hey, let's give it to, give it to an arms company straight away, with no expectation of doing any work." But if you say, "This two billion dollars has got to go into Colombia," but the Colombian government has to buy U.S. arms. And those arms has, have to be of a particular type, particular specification, that only one of these arms companies has. Mm -hmm. um, then that's just the way mm -hmm. of laundering this back into the United States. And what you're saying is that money and money making is at the center of modern war and it's almost self-perpetuating. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and it's becoming worse. Mm -hmm. um, the number of private companies that sprung up around Iraq, um, the number of private companies that are now supporting uh, the National Security Agency. This mm. has in, uh, increased a hundred times in the past ten years. The number of companies. So now you have, a, a, you know, a, a school, a feeding school that is feeding off the U.S. tax base, and is a lobby to make sure that those wars go on. And you, know, you have two sorts of lobbies. You have offensive lobbies and defensive lobbies. So an, o an offensive lobby tries to get new money that it didn't have before mm. by lobbying the, the levers of government. And a defensive lobby makes sure that companies continue to receive the money that they've been getting before. Mm. So now we're in a position in the United States where we have both enormous offensive lobbies and enormous defensive lobbies. But the defensive lobbies always fight harder um, they fight to keep um, the expectation of the money flow going mm. and 
uh, that apparatus is being built up in the past 10 years. And I think it's um, mm. going to be extremely difficult uh, to dismantle. What was your reaction when you first saw the Apache video that is now infamous? Oh. When I first saw this, we didn't know that there were journalists in it. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know the circumstances. We knew this was a, a tape of a helicopter attack, and otherwise nothing. Um, so I could immediately see that this was you know, a riskful attack on people walking in a street in a relaxed manner. Mm. Um, but I didn't know, were, were they armed? Were they really the bad guys? They seemed incredibly relaxed. It seemed like this was a, an attack that um, was very provocative. So if these people were um, insurgents, um, then they were insurgents on a, having a break playing on the street in a s suburb. Um, but as we dug deeper and deeper, uh, the situation became more and more appalling. Um, mm. So we found that clearly uh, nearly all of these people were not armed. Clearly there were two cameramen there holding cameras, not arms. Um, these cameramen turned out to be Reuters news reporters. Mm. Um, then looking at this wounded man crawling on the curb, um, we could spending more time in the detail, it was clear that there was no arms being picked up, that he was just being rescued by a passerby. Could you hear the voices? Could you hear the voices from the helicopter at this point? Yeah, we could hear the voices from the helicopter and, you know, sort of the, the grotesque language that uh, soldiers yeah. have. What really struck me was not the, uh, was not this very dark, grotesque humour. Mm. Um, I can accept that that people exercise black humour, very black humour sometimes in war. Uh, rather, it was the another day at the office mm -hmm. um, feel to routine. all the proceedings, how routine it was mm -hmm. to um, kill uh, these 18 to 26 people um, and that a whole street covered with bodies, the reaction to that was nice. Um, this tape for m me and the other people involved made nice a dirty word. Mm. So we just couldn't see something as being nice anymore when a whole street uh, covered with carnage uh, is nice. Mm. Nice, yeah. It, the, the reaction... Now let me ask you, wh what did you make of the the, re the reaction to it in the media, the mainstream media reaction to the release of this video? We've been involved in, obviously, many different um, stories that have produced mm. fallout in the United States and in other countries. Um, but this one was of a degree and of a, you know, about a specific issue that we were able to sort of plot how all this unfolded and blew out and what mm. the back reaction was. So initially, on the TV networks, um, there was an attempt to immediately downplay this. Mm. So for example, CNN, uh, yeah. Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, I mean, they only showed, they didn't, they took the first segment, which is not the most um, appalling one, the first attack, and then blanked out all the shooting, and then said this was out of sympathy or deference to the families. But there's no blood here, just, you can just see dust coming up. And then um, immediately started apologising uh, for the military, mm. um, saying, oh, well, you know, it's hard for our soldiers, and a reminder that you know, war, is, war is difficult. Um, no condemnation, not even any request for an inquiry, which is the sort of neutral mm. response well, we don't want to blame people before all the facts are in, although actually if you see the video, you've got most of them. But we want to know everything about this. We want this inquiry to be opened. We want forthcom a full disclosure. We want to know why this video was withheld uh, from Reuters for so long. Mm -hmm. So all we want to know uh, were the children 
the wounded compensated? Did they leave? All these things, which have been sort of natural reactions, um, did not take place uh, in the broadcast networks. Then, uh, for CNN and NBC, there was, I think, a sort of internal revolt by journalists who were seeing other journalists mowed down uh, in the streets of Baghdad. Mm. So a push back against the editorial management, management decision uh, to treat it so briefly and in such a biased way. So the next day saw a sort of richer um, discussion. And then it flipped. Then enormous editorial space, both in the printed press and in the TV press, opened up for military apologists. And no space opened up for anyone else, including people with new facts, including the soldiers on the ground who were there, the only English-speaking witnesses, mm. the only US witnesses and the only soldiers speaking. Those people couldn't get into the mainstream press and couldn't get onto the TV. Talk, talk about that one, the one soldier who, uh, uh, his name was McCord, is that right? Yeah. yeah. One of the soldiers on the ground who was one of those you see arriving at the van. Yes. Ethan McCord. Ethan McCord. Uh, is a soldier about 30 years old, was in the ground unit that was being serviced, if you like, by the Apaches in the, in the mm. sky. And they marched in and arrived to where the bodies were and the shooting up van. And Ethan heard the child crying in the van hysterically and pulled out the girl, saw the boy and thought the boy was dead. Mm. Took the child away from the van to a sort of an intermediary location and then went to look for anyone else in the van and just saw the boy was just breathing and pulled him out. So he ended up being covered with the blood of his children. Um, mm. And he was quite disturbed by this event. And he got in contact with us um, immediately after uh, the video was published. And he produced a statement of a letter of apology uh, to this mm. family. Of course, he wasn't involved directly uh, with killing them, but indirectly, it was his unit that um, was being serviced uh, by this Apache. Mm. Uh, and indirectly, it was, he was part of the U.S. Army um, in Iraq. Mm. But he says that, you know, that he complained to his superiors about this event, and they just told him to stop being a pussy mm. and to suck it up. Um, and he's tried uh, quite hard to draw attention to what happened uh, in the mainstream, to get the mainstream press interested in uh, in it. Um, within two days of us revealing the material. So why it was still newsworthy, it, it can't be any excuse um, mm. in the US press to, well, the, the moment had passed and therefore, okay, yes, his story is interesting, but the moment has passed. Because at the very same time mm. that he was trying to get his story across, editorial space was being given to military apologists mm. who were just, you know, war is hard and it's difficult These things soldiers. happen. These things happen. And you didn't show the full context. And uh, That's they, right. were, they were shooting that morning. Yep. Uh, so on and so on. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. you know, soldiers, it's difficult for soldiers, psychologically, yeah. or whatever. Not new facts. Mm. Whereas, whereas this soldier mm. had new facts about mm. what had happened then and a, an incident that happened he, immediately he, after. I mean, what was interesting about him, he also had uh, an overview and he described what had happened that day as a common occurrence. And he talked about if, if there was any kind of threat or perceived threat to American soldiers, they would, they would let everybody have it. Uh, he said, let, let all the motherfuckers have it at 360 degrees. That's right, if, if there was an ID. He, uh, he was I wish there was an IED. Yeah, if he was instructed mm. by his commanding mm. officer that mm. if there, yeah. if an IED goes off um, yeah. anywhere in the street, yeah. um, then mm. 360 degree rotational fire and just take out everyone. Women, yeah. children, everyone gets it. Uh, 
I guess, as is uh, to try and act as a disincentive yeah. uh, for the local population for, for supporting uh, any IED placement. And, and, and that's what happened. Yes. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's not that he was told that and it didn't happen, but rather no. that yeah. happened and he was instructed. Yeah. So he and some other soldiers in this unit who didn't like that instruction apparently fired high uh, when those orders came, when an IED went off and they were instructed to fire those orders. What, what, what do the leaks uh, around this issue tell you about whether this particular incident was, as the government, the US government claims, an aberration or not? Well, we have seen in other leaks, I mean, uh, just a, a vast number of these type of incidents. And when I say these type, what I mean is indiscriminate attacks on civilians. Mm. Not deliberate attacks on civilians, it's important to make clear, but just not giving a damn, mm. not caring um, whether they are or whether they aren't. Sometimes occasional attack, deliberate attacks on civilians, but those do seem to be rare in the record. But just, you know, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but we want to shoot, uh, and so go, so go for it. Now, Ethan McCord and one of his fellow soldiers who were in that ground unit, they say that they were surprised it was this video that leaked because there were many, many worse incidences and this mm. was a sort of everyday mm. occurrence. Mm. It's not every day that journalists are killed. Although I did read the statistic that uh, there have been seven Reuters journalists killed in Baghdad and all of them uh, were killed by US military fire. Mm. But probably the only reason we are talking about this now is because there were two journalists there and they were sort of trackable and Reuters put in a Freedom of Information Act request. Whereas if they weren't journalists, if they were just regular citizens of Baghdad, um, we wouldn't even be talking about it. The material just would have been buried. There would have been no uh, internal investigation at all which prompted the eventual leaking. So this is a kind of tip of an awful iceberg in many ways, isn't it? Because a war like Iraq and a war like Afghanistan, if not directed at civilians, civilians become the casualties. They're civilians' wars, in a, way, in a sense, aren't they? You know, there's the old statement that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you can see from this video that when you're in an Apache with a a zoom lens that can show you people's face from one mile up in the sky and you have a 30 millimeter cannon and you shoot and there's no effect against you you can't even hear the screams and when you get back to base there's no discipline procedures against you but when this happens every day for days you know for a year of course it's incredibly corrupting mm. and you know, pe these people uh, are shot in the same way that, that the everyday person uh, walks over ants on the street because they just seem to be irrelevant, they don't complain, there's no discipline procedure. And so as the war goes along, civilians do become just something to you know, get rid of uh, because they're uh, annoying um, or have no concern uh, over. Mm. And while there, there are, um, while some of these uh, civilian massacre cases do achieve prominence and then uh, do um, uh, find uh, genuine concern um, by some of the higher generals or by other groups looking into them, that's not what we see for the everyday cases of civilian kills. And we have acquired records um, of six years worth of civilian kills for Iraq and Afghanistan. And not just the big ones, mm. where there's 100 people killed or 20 people killed, mm. where there is some investigation of publicity sometimes, but rather these sort of everyday uh, incidences where a man might be, in one, as in one case, in Afghanistan, a man is seen to be running away after US soldiers approach. 
and they try and shoot him, the guns jam, so he's running towards the village. So what do they do? The guns are jammed, they get the artillery, and they shell him. There's one man, they launch shells towards him, they overshoot, hit the village, and they kill a five-year-old boy. So there's mm. hundreds and hundreds of those small incidences which sort of reveal the, the squalor of war at a, a microscopic mm. detail. It's not always these big kill events, it's uh, these little events where there's a, a lack of concern and care about the sort of lethal engagement, the use of lethal force. Another example from Afghanistan is um, American troops going through an area, they're not receiving fire, but they see some unexploded ordnance. They see a 1.5 meter shell that's sitting there in a, in a sort of dusty area. And could it be a booby trap? Possibly. Could be a booby trap. Might not. I mean, they could just walk past. Mm. What should they do? Should they shoot it? Should they call in their bomb disposal squad, which is what you'd normally do, mm. um, and have it taken care of? No, so they call in airstrike instead to take out just this one unexploded shell. Um, now, presumably, the, these are guys in Afghanistan, they're bored. And they, mm. sit on, they want to see what an airstrike's like up close. It's very easy. It's in the daytime. So they call an airstrike. The airstrike overshoots the shell. It's a village. This is sort of just a lack of concern, a lack of care. Are these particular incidents from the documents <coughs> that you've released in July? Yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah, and the, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Can you just describe the almost the panorama of these documents? They're across. Afghanistan and yeah, Iraq. And Iraq. So for, for Afghanistan, this is 91,000 reports by troops on the ground mm. uh, and by some intelligence people back at the base. These are like done just after an event happens or are updated during the course of the day. So mm. they have sort of raw data before, before Pentagon spin doctors have had a chance to massage it. Although that said, sometimes troops don't put things in there that might incriminate them either. Hmm. Um, and for Iraq, this is 490,000 reports over the same period. 490,000? 490,000 over the same period of time. <laughs> that's a hell of a leak. <laughs> yeah, that's a really <laughs> extraordinary thing. This is the, the most finely detailed history of war that has ever been disclosed precise times, locations, kill counts, although the kill counts are sometimes massaged, um, but kill counts, people detained, what happened from the US troops point of view. Mm. Now, they're not reliable narrators, but you can't hide everything when you're producing so much detail so quickly. And I mean, it's just extraordinary. So we wrote a computer program to add up all these kill counts. Um, and so for uh, Afghanistan, this is in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands? Hundreds of thousands. It's important to remember this wasn't just a, we got an aggregate figure of a hundred thousands. This hundreds of thousands is a result of adding up all the individual cases which are documented. So the individual cases, the, the highest kill count um, was 480 or so. Uh, related to a, a stampede that occurred on a bridge. Uh, 480 people were killed. In, well, in checking this in the news reports, it seems like it was more like a thousand people were killed, but in the internal US military reporting, it's 480 people mm. uh, who were killed. And, but that's the single highest event. That's a sort of un, a bit unusual. The next one down was a, a US sweeping operation that killed about 300. Um, some of these events are on the surface, um, disturbing. So the highest kill count event in Afghanistan uh, killed 181 people in a US operation uh, led by Canada uh, called Operation Medusa. 
September, this, uh, December 2006. And that kill count of 181, there was only one wounded. One wounded? One wounded. It says no civilians were killed and there were no captures. So if we then look at what was the sort of military hardware deployed, so it, it speaks about some ground force sweep and, and so on, a couple mm. of people being killed there, but nearly everyone uh, who was listed being killed was killed by a <coughs> an AC-130 gunship. So this is, an AC-130 is a big, big yeah. cargo plane which has been converted to have, be decked out with machine guns and tank guns and... Uh, so saturation uh, fire yeah. from... From yeah. high up, but it's a plane yeah. that's moving. I yeah. mean, this is, it's not exact. Mm. Um, and uh, in the course of three hours, 62 people are described as being killed by this. And then there's also an unexplained missing uh, 90 or so people. Where how they are killed is not established in the report, but they are listed uh, as having been killed in two places. And do they call these all the uh, Taliban, the enemy? Uh, yeah, they're mm. all called the enemy. Looking at, looking at that Operation Reducer kill, um, that broader operation, quite interesting. I mean, I hadn't heard about this before. But this was the, the biggest, according to the Canadian military, the biggest operation in Afghanistan post-invasion. And But Afghanistan wasn't on people's radar in December 2006. Iraq was. Um, but during that week, they say that they killed about a thousand um, Taliban. But actually, what happened is that this was in a region of about 20k out of uh, Kandahar, where there's lots of vineyards, and um, there was a, the government installed by um, U.S. forces post the 2001 invasion had become extremely corrupt, and the local people had grown to support the Taliban in sort of united effort to clean out this government, and then when. US and Canadian and well, uh, when ISAF, sort of mm. the allied forces, NATO. Allied, the Western forces yeah. came in. Mm -hmm. um, these people, not just Taliban, they do seem to have been Taliban there, but the, the local population were supportive. And so the men in the vineyards, the, the workers in the vineyards, uh, were killed along with these others. Um, and it seems to, if we read the press reports at times, some press say it's 50-50, 50% Taliban, 50% local people. It's pretty hard to gauge from the, mm. the on-the-ground on the reporting. But we look at events like this leaked document shows and we see something pretty disturbing. A lot of people killed for very little time, using indiscriminate fire, um, no investigation into 181 people being killed, the biggest kill mm. single event. Um, in Afghanistan post 2001, uh, it doesn't it doesn't mm. smell right. Yeah, yeah I suppose th those doing the killing, who I, I'm assuming they regard everybody as the Taliban or as insurgents. Well, uh, the pattern. So who isn't yeah. children? The uh, pat the pattern we see in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the very clear pattern, and it's not just me who sees this, but other war reporters, yeah. is that anyone who's a man is and dead is an insurgent. That's how they're always listed on the reports. And it's only after there's some investigation, usually stimulated by the press or mm. by um, a competing military reporting on it, um, mm. that then there's a sort of pull down from that number. Yeah. So not any, any man who is dead is insurgent or Taliban, children, if their bodies are whole enough to see, and remember things like, 30 millimeter cannon fire will decimate the body, um, are listed as children. So they're not listed as insurgents and women can go either way. And <laughs> so as an example, if we look at Kunduz, this is um, an airstrike that uh, occurred in Afghanistan last year where uh, uh, it was called in by the German military mm. petrol tankers uh, about three kilometres away from German military positions had been put in a riverbed and the local people were unlaid, unlaiding the petrol from them, taking this off. Now, 
the, the allegation is that the Taliban uh, hijacked these petrol tankers and were then giving the petrol to the local population, which is quite possibly true. I mean, maybe they're trying to curry favour the local population, but the reality is there was over 100 people clustered around this tanker, mm. tanker taking the petrol. And they weren't going anywhere, they were sitting there. Um, so mm. airstrike was called in and killed most of these people. Yet, when we look at the internal military reporting by the United States, what we see is, in these leaked reports, 57 insurgents killed. When we look at the internal military reporting for um, the collateral murder, the uh, Iraq um, massacre, which included two Reuters journalists that happened in July 2007, what we see is um, 14 people killed, and there were actually between 18 to 26 people killed, and all of them insurgents, except for two children who were wounded. Hmm. And so so even the Reuters cameramen were listed as insurgents. As insurgents. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Until Reuters came in contact mm. and said, hey, where's our cameraman? Yeah. The, I mean, for you to receive that volume of documentation suggests that there must be something of a rebellion going on within the system. Yes. It, I mean, it's the one hopeful thing is, in fact, that there are good people in the US military. There are good people in the Mm. military intelligence organization and some of those people have had enough and so they provide provide us with uh, evidence of mm. abuse and I mean that's um mm. it is a, it's sort of another way of being a conscientious objector and in fact um, arguably a far more powerful way of objecting uh, yeah. to the war yeah and what about among journalists is there a rebellion amongst journalists. I mean, you said uh, some time ago, I think, that journalists uh, need to respect their readers and viewers. Um, how, how, do, how do journalists, by and large, react to WikiLeaks? Of course, some are very impressed, obviously, but you've described, for example, the reaction in the United States with CNN and NBC and CBS and so on as journalists being used to justify it. So how do journalists, how, how are journalists dealing with the arrival of WikiLeaks? Yeah, a very interesting mixture. So, you know, it seems like all the good journalists support us and all the, all the bad ones don't. <laughs> but of course, Maybe that's just my interpretation based upon <laughs> their support. <laughs> Probably a good interpretation. <laughs> but um, it does seem that the, the more accomplished and independent the journalists, the more they are likely to support us. Mm. Um, the more they are able, in fact, to, the more established they are as an independent journalist with their own independent reputation that they can choose to take from one newspaper to another they can choose to take from one network to another mm. if they're stuffed around. Um, it seems like the more they are able to state their support uh, for us, mm. whereas the journalists who are not in that position of freedom, that are more part of the, the group of, of the company, that they're company men, um, they're more likely to be critical. Because your very WikiLeaks is very threatening to systems. And uh, the BBC is a system. Um, the network making this documentary, ITV, is a system. So individual journalists, as opposed to the organisations that they're working in, are supportive of us in that they may be able to collaborate with us or use our material. And that can be extremely important material. And some people um, have an ability to see that and they want to help them and so get that material out to the public or bring extra angles in on it or use their existing understanding to help flesh mm. it out. So they see us as, you know, as um, colleagues. And then we have a group that sees us as competition, that sees us as a threat. And in the regular sort of competitive, news competitive mm. sense, 
but also in that we are demanding certain standards, certain higher levels of information, harder to get information, and the use of primary sources in mm. material that has been released in print. Mm. So that makes them have to work harder. Mm. So they see us as a threat. And then there's another group that appreciates, uh, appreciates what we're doing because we're drawing the fire. Mm. So we are the free press vanguard. We are the sort of defender of whistleblowers. And we move that whole field further out. And that mm. creates a sort of a vacuum behind us into which these people can come, which doesn't have any fire because we're, we're attracting the opposition by pushing the mm -hmm. envelope. And that's quite nice because over the last four years, we have been changing the standard. Mm. So to some degree, we are now the status quo. Mm. We, we are something that exists. There's an economic and political and social niche. You're the mainstream go quite that far, but, but it, there's an understanding, a political and economic understanding that there is a place for WikiLeaks yeah. in this world, and that if we were to disappear, that would be something new. Mm. I mean, it's quite, yeah, it's quite interesting that how I, you've shifted in. I mean, here, uh, uh, the Guardian media pages uh, every year lists uh, the 100 most important media people. You've probably seen this. This year, they've included you. Yeah, this year, you know, uh, 58. But last year, we weren't in there at all. <laughs> That's quite an improvement. <laughs> the fact that you're in there is interesting. Very interesting. I mean, I, it's true we do have some influence, but I think it's also the case that those people in the Guardian, whoever put that list together, and I'm sure it's a totally accurate list, but um, I'm sure that's also a desire there's a desire for us to be leading in that way. Mm. And that they want to support, um, support mm. us, mm. see that we do something mm. beneficial for them, which is to, to open up this space. I mean, there's, there's clearly a big shift underway, and we've talked about this already. Um, but the shift is from traditional so-called mainstream journalists, journalism to what has become known as citizen journalism. It, is, that, is that a very significant shift now? It, is, it, is the whole nature of journalism likely to change because of this, this trend? It is changing uh, and the, the changes will be dramatic that I'm not one to sell citizen journalism as being, at the moment, um, being a great answer yet. Mm. And because what I see in the alternative press is very little journalism going on. Mm. In fact, what I see is people taking the front page of New York Times, using that as their issue of the day, and saying, I don't agree with it, or I do agree with it. Mm. Um, and when our idea is that our material would spark tremendous amounts of citizen journalism, because all these people who write opinion pieces on blogs and so on, when given the complaint, why aren't you doing any real journalism? Why aren't you going and research or investigating something? Mm. They say, well, it takes a long time to build up sources. So we don't have anything new to talk about, so we have to just analyse mm. what the mainstream press are doing. So, but mm. we have produced a, a hundreds of thousands or millions of, millions mm. of pages um, of new source material mm. that these people could analyse and could report, and it's extremely rare that they do. Mm. So the, the specific example that I like to use is we got hold of a classified US intelligence report into what happened in the war in Fallujah. So this was a left cause celeb brief um, that um, invasion of the town of Fallujah in Iraq in 2004. Of course, Iraq itself had already been mm. invaded, but Fallujah was some kind of holdout to the new government that had been put in place by the United States, the Coalition Provisional Authority. Mm -hmm. And 
that uh, the circumstances of that invasion, some U.S. contractors uh, going through mm -hmm. this area mm -hmm. uh, had, had been killed. And anyway, mm -hmm. so not wanting to go into the detail, but that was a, a very bloody um, invasion and it ended up with a pullout and a, a reinvasion some five months later. Mm. So what were the circumstances? Everyone knew that all sorts of tragedy had occurred in that town. This report, in fact, revealed both how things progressed militarily, how things progressed politically, spoke specifically about Paul Bremer, who was the, the head of the Coalition Regional Authority, the role of Al Jazeera mm. in that town, the, the media war, as well as the on-the-ground war. The different tribal regions, classified secret by a U.S. Mm. Army ground intelligence. So we took this classified U.S. intelligence report about mm. Fallujah mm. and released it. Mm. So all citizen journalists, academics, mm. employed journalists would analyze it, write about it, mm. call up the U.S. military, ask them about it, mm. ask uh, the countries involved, human mm. rights groups, what was going on, etc. This was the, the raw primary ingredient that you needed to actually do some journalism. And mailed this out to 3,500 people uh, on our mailing list. And the result was not a single citizen journalist did anything. The first person to publish was a friend, Sean Waterman at UPI, who was the national security reporter. Um, and then another five um, professional press journalists. Not all of them full-time journalists, some mm. working for the Asia Times half-time and working for the Cato Institute half-time as an example of one of these five. Yeah. But um, the bloggers, the political activists of all kinds, uh, in fact, didn't do anything with this material. So, I mean, that's interesting. So real information or can almost paralyze as if they don't know what to do with it. Well, I over time, we are seeing that we're sort of training people up a bit. Mm. So it's getting better over time. People are yeah. starting to become used to this military information and nomenclature, understanding that when we release yeah. it is, is definitely true. Um, but yeah, a yeah. very surprising effect. I mean, that report, mm. as an example, it looked good. It wasn't mm. just that it had the important details. Mm. It wasn't too long. It was mm. only... Mm. It was accessible. 30 pages. It was accessible. Mm. It had a nice map of Fallujah on the front, split into tribal regions. And no one picked it up. No one picked it up. It, <laughs> and eventually, um, professional press picked it up. Mm. You're making some very serious enemies, um, uh, not least of all a government engaged in two rapacious wars. I, I, how do you deal with what must be a sense of that danger? Do you ignore it or do you um, accommodate it within yeah. yourself? So, not at all. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of people say uh, we're very courageous in our work. Mm. And I wouldn't reject that label entirely. We're not uncourageous. But to me, courage is not the absence of fear at all. Courage mm. is for the the intellectual mastery of fear by understanding. So we just understand what the risks are and mm. having understood them, we're able to navigate the path through them. Mm. One of my good friends who's a, a reporter for the Standard newspaper in Kenya, mm. investigative head, whenever he is about to publish a big story exposing the Kenyan government and they were raid, the newspaper was raided by the police a couple of years ago, mm. um, he publishes, he goes to Tanzania he waits to see what happens. Eventually it becomes clear what's going to happen and he comes back. If he doesn't understand the risk, if he understands the risk and he sees that it's, it's relatively low risk, then he publishes and he stays in Nairobi. And so that's how we work. What, 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 what do you do? Because you're, I would have thought, unlikely to go to the United States at the moment. Well, in July of 2010, um, I had three uh, speaking engagements in the United States. Mm. 
including one at the investigative reporters and editors conference in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, a panel there with Scott Risen, uh, New York Times national mm -hmm. security reporter, and mm -hmm. Valerie Plain was also in the panel. Mm -hmm. I cancelled my visit uh, to the United States uh, because of some information that was coming out from our sources um, within the US administration saying that it would be a danger to me uh, to go to the United States. Mm. In the, uh, in the Pentagon recently, I asked the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Brian Whitman, uh, this. I said, can you, as a senior official of the United States government, can you give a guarantee that the editors of WikiLeaks and the editor-in-chief himself, who is not American, that's you, are not in danger, that they themselves will not be subjected to the kind of hunt that we've read about in the media. And uh, his reply in a nutshell, well, first of all, it's not my position to give guarantees on anything. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, it sounds like keeping all options on the table uh, to me. And but they're not good options, are they? I don't, I don't want to dramatize this too much, but you're in a sort of unique position, in a way, uh, aren't you? I don't We're think there's a been a WikiLeaks yeah, before. There hasn't, and they don't know how to deal with us. And there's mm. no, I mean, something that has preserved us is that there's no, um, in the United States or in any other country, there is no department to deal with WikiLeaks. Yeah. Uh, most of those government departments are split up into regional focuses. Mm. Um, so there's no sort of specialist in, in dealing what with what we are or understanding what we are or understanding how to deal with this. But, I mean, there are serious statements coming out of the US administration under the surface that um, imply that they would not follow the rule of law. Uh, that's a, a they would not follow the rule. Implied that they would not follow the rule of law, and that, that is a serious matter. There's a certain record there, yeah. And there were senior figures like Cy Hirsch giving me warnings, uh, mm. a famous US national security reporter. And so I mean, we listened uh, to those mm. warnings and took appropriate uh, security mm. precautions. That said, I think our political position uh, in countries like the United Kingdom Australia, Iceland, Germany, um, and other countries with less strength um, mm. is, is such that it is impossible to I mean, arrest me here in the United Kingdom. Mm. Politically, uh, it is just not possible to do that. Mm. Um, yeah. Now, why some intermediary bureaucrat might do it and not understand the political risk, um, eventually the matter would be pushed up high enough uh, and you know, mm. people in a with better understanding of politics mm. uh, will go. Do not do that. Uh, that's just going to create a, a terrible political dilemma for everyone concerned. Don't do it. I I, I note your your preemptive strike in uh, in response when you posted on WikiLeaks a leaked Pentagon document that says that the U.S. intelligence intends to destroy WikiLeaks. And the words used are that they would f wanted to fatally marginalise the organisation. Um, yeah, and uh, destroy our centre of gravity. Mm. They're using a sort of military language, which is yeah. what they say is the, the trust that sources and public have in us. If they can destroy that, then they can stop US military whistleblowers coming to us. And they say the word whistleblower. I mean, they're, mm. they're not talking about... Um, or at least not just talking about unauthorised disclosures which may or may not be revealing abuse. They are saying whistleblowers, people who reveal abuse, they give examples. Examples mm. given are Guantanamo Bay, when we mm. released the main manuals for this, which revealed that they were hiding people from the Red Cross, falsifying documents and so on. Um, mm. Fallujah mm. and abuses that we revealed there and a number of other cases. So these are, they are upset with us because we are revealing abuses and embarrassing uh, the United States military. Uh, mm. So we released that report, which was written in 2008. We released this uh, earlier in 2010. 
Um, as, as you know, maybe as a preemptive strike. I mean, it's putting them on notice. Uh, mm. And by us releasing that, there is an understanding. You know, that didn't come from nowhere. That report clearly came from some intelligence insiders in the United States. We have support inside the US intelligence community. Uh, mm. So it is, it is difficult and dangerous uh, for people within the US intelligence community to try and investigate us because there will be dissidents uh, that will step forward um, mm. and reveal that. So they have to tread very carefully. What happens when you return to Australia, your homeland? Because when you went back recently, um, they took away your passport, um, saying that it was looked worn and uh, something uh, you perhaps needed a new one. But miraculously, you didn't need a new one. They gave it back to you some time later. Yeah, and, and just a little bit after that, they uh, also searched my bags and made references to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Australian Federal Police, uh, specific mm. information uh, that had to have come off their database file. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. In Australia, I mean, there is a sort of patriotism in Australia that is proud uh, of WikiLeaks and proud of me. Mm -hmm. And that is defensive, and as a result, there have been um, very positive articles in in the Fairfax Press and uh, in the Australian. Um, mm. So I'm told by my you know, politically connected people in Australia that uh, it would be extremely difficult to arrest me, detain me, or deport me, uh, yeah. or our other uh, volunteers in Australia. That said, that there has been extensive spying mm. um, on our people in that country, mm. Um, mm. which I assume has been agreed to in mm. some way by the Australian government, and we have mm. some information about the Australian government being involved in that. Is it hard after a while to keep these shadows at bay do you get used to them? You must say to yourself, look, I, I, I can't become paranoid about this. You know, I'm going to live a normal life. Is that difficult? Oh, it's become pretty easy. I mean, yeah. we have some security precautions, we have some security procedures, we have different people doing different things in different places depending on mm. their need for security. Uh, mm. For me, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm followed around uh, provided I'm not meeting with a source. Quite a few BBC journalists who have got in touch with me and want to talk about um, the pressure within the BBC. In other words, Great. they represent the kind of rebellion that you're describing. What would you say to people like them in an institution like the BBC, or indeed journalists who are led by their conscience or just by their professional integrity within certain organisations. What would you say to them? What can they do? Oh, w when, when your stories are killed, get them to us and we'll publish them. That's the, the simplest one. Or when the primary source material is, is um, suppressed, get them to us. I mean, you, d you don't have to leave the institution. You can work on the inside and on the outside and keep this line between the two invisible. Um, so what they can't get on air and what they can't get in the paper, give to yeah, WikiLeaks. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't, you know, there's, no, there's not so much career motivation to do that because you kind of yeah. stick your name on it um, at the time. But later on, maybe you can put your name on it, you know, when you leave the institution. What wouldn't you accept? Yeah. What wouldn't you publish? What leak? wouldn't you publish? Unlike every other news organisation, we say precisely in policy what we will and will not mm. accept for the material that we publish. So we say to whistleblowers, we will take material that hasn't appeared before. It is being some force suppressing it, legal or mm. threat of violence or being fired. Um, and that is of diplomatic, political, ethical or historical significance and that you didn't write yourself. So 
provided it fits that, we will publish it. Now, we might go through some harm minimization process in the interim. So the, the only forms that that has taken is, uh, as an example, the British National Party, when we published their secret yeah. uh, membership list. We contacted all these people ahead of time and we said, oh, we're going to publish this in a few days. Um, we're giving you the heads up, just in case mm -hmm. this, you know, your telephone number being public and so on causes problems. You go and sort it out. So that has always worked so far. We're aware of no instance where anyone mm. has come to any sort of physical harm uh, mm -hmm. as a result of anything we've published. We are aware of quite a few results where people have been fired or lost elections as a result of things that we've published, but mm -hmm. that yeah. seem to be on the side of the angels. Um, if at some stage that policy doesn't seem to be working, mm -hmm. then we'll create a new policy. Remember, our goal is just as our means is transparency. We don't confuse these two. The propaganda efforts of governments has become vast. I read an AP investigation that said the US was spending four point, had spent 4.7 billion over the last five years on basically winning hearts and minds, not of the enemy, but of its own people. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, this, this kind of information war and Petraeus, General Petraeus, in his counterinsurgency manual refers to wars of perception in which the media is, is one of the weapons. Um, it, it, so information war has never been more important. But what happens when WikiLeaks runs into the United Kingdom, which has some of the most draconian secrecy laws in the world, such as the Official Secrets Act? Is it more difficult here to, to mine information? We haven't found a, a problem publishing uh, UK information. Mm. I mean, when we look at the Official Secrets Act label documents, um, we see they state that it is an offence to retain the information, and it is an offence to destroy the information. So the only possible outcome is that we have to publish the information. <laughs> um, and that's what which you've done. we have done on, on many, many occasions. I, I noticed one that one of one of the, those that I uh, had a, a personal interest in was one that uh, from the Ministry of Defence classified document that um, equated. Uh, terrorists with investigative journalists as threats. And Russian spies. And Russian spies. Yeah, as, as in fact, in many sections of that report, investigative journalists are the number one uh, threat to the sort of information security uh, I, I, of the minist Ministry of Defence. That was a 2,000-page a document on how to stop leaks uh, from yeah. the Ministry of Defence, which, which we leaked. I didn't know whether to be uh, offended or honoured. Well, um, it's ni nice to be having a, an, an impact. <laughs> I highly recommend uh, following John Pilger's work. Uh, there's no doubt about that. <coughs> I think he went. Come back. We now appreciate or This is. Oh, oh no, God! No, not, not democracy now. <coughs> oh, God. come back we appreciate all the advantage points to even negative ones oh, my God. <laughs> yeah maybe just uh, like I said just needs to be uh, better himself to attract better people in a circle right Oh my god, don't you dare call <laughs> negative John Pilger. John Pilger is amazing and his uh, website is here. And uh, I'll provide this. Uh, highly recommend uh, following his work. And if you've never watched John Pilger documentaries, I highly recommend watching his documentaries. Year Zero uh, is absolutely brilliant. Okay. Uncharted Ace, how are you doing? ear poison ear poison spectral shot indeed uh hey chicho glad to 
glad to have um, caught the stream we'll have to watch from beginning later on okay most of the stream was just basically this interview um, with uh, Julian Assange uh, on Charter Days uh, and it's a fantastic interview highly recommend it's the first uh, interview of John Pilger with uh, Julian Assange Tyson Terror you used to be like him yeah many people I've met many people that just have a, such a negative attitude towards life uh, which is their choosing uh, to a certain degree I realize uh, the world society economics politics can beat you down but it is your choice if you choose to acquire that perspective of the world or rise above it um, so good on you tyson for coming out of that why is it extremely important question to ask to grow yeah indeed tyson emily pleasure Fedomite. the 98 we forget is a phenomenal doc John, John Pilger has put out some amazing documentaries and that's about two hours gang um, there's so much that we left on the table I think uh, we're gonna slowly start doing uh, more Julian Assange streams as uh, as the date of the hearing the judgment from the show trial comes to be I think it's January 4th so I think we're going to do more of these uh, Julian Assange streams. And I think what we're going to do is read articles, watch videos, watch interviews. There's a documentary series or talk show series that Julian Assange put out through RT that has like seven or eight episodes. And all of those are worth, worth watching. Phenomenal discussions about technology and information. Okay. On charge today, I don't see the point of having a negative viewpoint on life. You only live once. Might as well enjoy it. Might as well right some people uh, tend to be dramatic uh, too dramatic right so personally when I come across people that oh my car got scratched oh you know someone bumped into me oh this oh this oh humanity is or humanity is I tend to sort of distance myself slowly away from them uh, if they're older if they're older it basically means they're they've indoctrinated themselves like to break down those barriers and those that mindset the neuro the neurons the connections of negativity negativity that they have built for themselves is very difficult right that's why you know the realm of entheogens is a great way to shatter the mind right Maldegras to great vid very samari as you said yeah huge huge i love this interview by the way it's one of my uh, I've only watched it twice I watched well three times I guess I watched it again yesterday as well uh, but I watched it a couple of times the first time it came out and then watched it again and uh, it's it's a good interview to remind yourself uh, what's at stake right I'm sleepy Emily says I put an interview of Chen uh, Gorcha Chen in the preview section of your discord awesome thanks a lot post apocalypse uh tyson terror what he was saying wasn't necessarily untrue but he was not getting the reason why things are the way that that way and that you can change it if you understand what's actually happening indeed i mean the the basically if we have transparency of power then we can hold power accountable one of the problems in our societies is that the crimes of centralized power and those elite, uh, those who have been put in positions of power, may they be corporations or individuals, the crimes that they have committed have only been leaked available to the public decades after the fact. That's why the United States government has this, or every government has this uh, time where you know top secret stuff can only be really revealed after 50 years or something like this that's because we can't hold whoever committed those crimes accountable if we have transparency of power in real time which is what wikileaks is providing okay is a game changer then we can hold people accountable that's why the discussion during these elections in the united states is 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 garbage because people are saying oh 
we're going to start holding people accountable wait, wait a second from now on wait a second you can hold people accountable right now but they're not they're not holding the leaders in either democratic or republican party accountable for their crimes so everybody's lost in a in in rhetoric in garbage really i wonder if they will stop uh remembers day this month is it remembers day this month mick i think we all get <laughs> i think we all get i think we all get there at some point it's just a shame uh, many wait till their later ages before uh, before coming to the realization what they've missed it's a sad shame when you think of it yeah indeed Mick right I've met some people that they look back and they they realize they've written off three decades of their lives because of their negativity now uh, if that's what you're referring to and for them to begin to change their life for the positive it is extremely difficult extremely difficult some have been able to do it uh, majority will not okay you also get into trouble um, taking uh, your small sample size of observations and applying it to humanity as a whole and agreed <laughs> agreed a fish named squish and I love your name example I have had some bad experiences with humans so all humans are bad got the questions absolute statements indeed games don't vote for someone that is supposed to okay so just because there's elections happening I'm, how do we delete your this post of yours well i'm going to time you out because if you were paying attention did it delete yeah nice uh if you were paying attention uh the elections are irrelevant okay in large part in large part Snowden and Assange will be viewed by history as heroes. Too bad it won't help them now. They they are viewed uh, as heroes and truth tellers by by many of us, and those who consider Assange and Snowden to be uh, the the bad guys, they can kiss my ass. On Charlie Chicho. Will you be doing a video on the elections? I, I hadn't planned on it on Charter Days. Uh, if <laughs> Cheryl's laughing, <laughs> I believe that. That's regarding the image that popped up, right? Uh, I wasn't planning on on Charter Days uh, because it it's not going to be over after today. And I've mentioned before, what will make or break the United States of America is U.S. foreign policy, not a circus, like really a circus people are concerned about a circus with the with the puppets being two two human beings that i would not invite to my house for dinner <laughs> like no uh rush rush home when i saw notifications let's go <laughs> boy we're at the end <laughs> i love it Oh boy, love it, brother or sister, of course, right? Sorry, I was uh, stealing the message. Ah, uh -huh. uh, you were. Uh, so you took a screen cap. A vote for Biden continues a uh, funnel money into Israel to wipe out Palestinians. A vote for Trump continues to funnel money into Israel to wipe out Palestinians. I think I'll pass on that one. Mick, I'm one hundred percent with you, right? I'm one hundred percent with you. I'll vote for a beautiful salad dressing tonight. Awesome, Mick. Post apocalypse. Uh, focusing on a, any particular politician is often a distraction because the problems are um, often uh, systematic and they they point fingers at each other to dodge fixing those problems. Indeed, indeed. Poor void, <laughs> Mick. Uncharted Chicho, I agree with you that the election is, is irrelevant, but I think we need more people saying this, and it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, Uncharted Days, uh, if you remind us on Discord, I'll plan on. Uh, we do current event stream, so in the next current event stream, we can definitely focus on the elections. Um, now, nothing's going like. There are certain like here's the kicker, right? Like 
anybody that's vote, voting for not anybody but anybody that actually is voting for biden because they like biden is an idiot anybody that's voting for trump because they actually like trump is an idiot right but those who are trashing trump are because of his uh, because of his deportation policies policies never spoke a word when obama was deporting more people than trump never spoke a word when obama was starting wars right like according to official definition of starting wars right trump officially hasn't started any wars he's the only president that doesn't start any war since carter every other president has been in ground war right like it's just a facade anyway it's a joke uh lava tony chicho assange is a bad guy and he is in jail and a global menace <laughs> tony don't crack me up <laughs> Your laugh out loud, Tony. You forgot the slash sarcasm. Personally, I don't know Assange on a personal level, but what he has done has been a huge, huge boom for humanity. Okay, he has done more for humanity than um, than anyone that I can think of off the top of my head. And if you give me a month, maybe I'll try to dig up something, someone uh, that has done more. To bring transparency and accountability of power for humanity than assange but right now and i've been at this game for a while there is no one that i can name that has done more to bring freedom to us than julian assange and i don't give a rat's ass if in person i wouldn't want to be friends with him i respect his work all right this is not about his personality this is about his work right a fish named squash squish there are lots of similarities between the parties there are also important differences on things like reproductive rights uh, same uh, sex marriage voter this in France and again uh, a fish uh, a fish named squish I'll, I'll say this again what will make or break the united states of america is u.s foreign policy not u.s domestic policy you're talking about u.s domestic policy u.s domestic policy is irrelevant what you're seeing take place in the united states of america is blowback from what everything the united states has done around the globe over the last few decades it is u.s foreign policy that will make to break the united states of america not u.s domestic policy it won't it won't matter chicho he is a part of the forces of disintegration rather than integration uh, information elder god actually i know one david has <laughs> elder god says especially when the spongebob movie make two sides of the same coin political pony show to keep one assertive in the idea that they have a voice when in reality not even the ones we perceive to be to be in power actually has any real power agreed agreed behind closed doors is where uh, one needs to look <laughs> Cheryl David has a <laughs> love it gang let's call the stream thank you for being here uh, mods thank you for staying top of things uh, gang thank you for the discussion thank you for the questions thank you for your perspective on things and thank you for uh, making sure that you're informed on what's taking place on uh regarding the greatest uh trial in a century the most important trial in the century the biggest show trial that i've ever heard i've ever even read about it's unprecedented right naming years takes off a cigarette mix says thanks for the stream have a great day everyone have a great day everyone and gang uh, if you want to know what this is about, I'm on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash chicho, C H Y C H O. You want to for follow this work? Patreon is a fantastic way to do so. I don't put anything behind paywalls, everything's creative commons. Share and share alike. Uh, for, for those of you who've been supporting this work through Patreon, thank you very much for your support. It is in large part because of your support that I'm able to do this, as well as support we've been getting from Twitch because this is where we're live streaming we have mods taking care of business we have people participating in these live streams and giving us feedback and we've built up a huge discord um, uh, channel 
where people are sharing a lot of information there's a lot of transparency going around it is fantastic gang thank you for the follows thank you for the subs uh, as well everyone and the discussions we do announce these live streams 30 minutes before we go live <coughs> on hello minds vk parlor gab and twitter you can follow the work there for live streams where we don't have any visuals we will be uploading the audio to soundcloud and as podcasts and they should be available on your favorite podcasting platforms and we will be uploading this video to both bitchute and youtube and if you want to support this work on bitchute and youtube you can follow you can share you can like you can comment and if you're on youtube you can join youtube membership okay gang thanks for being here everyone and uh i'm going to take a few days upload all the streams that we've done onto bitchute and youtube um I have a couple of comic book calls coming in i'll do most likely unannounced comic book calls this week and um and we'll see where things go everybody i don't care uh what your perspective is good luck stay positive be good okay and uh start having a positive outlook on life and make sure make sure you support the free flow of information and decentralization and learn your mathematics. Bye everyone.